Yeah, you, there is a um, there is a bias in academia. Okay, and it's it, it, you and I, I was involved in uh, on the Human Genome Project. I had government funding, and I was in that camp for a very long time, thinking that we needed government to fund market failure. Uh, in the case of the Human Genome Project, it was a very interesting, um, I'd say, test case for this because everyone was saying the government needed to put $3 billion into the Human Genome Project because no one else would. Then Solera shows up saying, we've got new sequencers and we can do this for $100 million and we'll be done next year. Government doubles down, decides to put more money into the Human Genome Project, even though there's an example of a market participant who's going to solve the problem. Uh, and they did this on the basis that all oh, the, the the private guys are greedy. They're probably going to patent patent the shit out of the genome. So we have to do it to keep it public, right? Well, the NIH ended up with more patents than Solera on the human genome. In the in the end of the day, so it was a pretty you know blunt lesson where I lost kind of my love that this NIH system is all for the good of the common man and we're above and beyond and don't have any greed like Solera has. When they ended up with more patents than Solera, that that's kind of a farce. So there's a bias in academia for centralized hierarchy in medicine, out of doubt. And then the who is like their emblem, right? Uh, however, you've got to be very cautious with people that are on that boat because uh, they aren't market forces involved in their research, right? They're, you get, when, you, when you write a government grant, right? Um, a lot of people say you need the government to write these grants because no industry is going to fund this ant, this ant farm research. And it's really early stuff and it has to be done by the government because the, the private sector won't fund it. I've written government grants. We've pulled in over 32 million in government grants over my career, and I'll tell you, there isn't a single grant we wrote that didn't cost us at least a million dollars to file. So the private sector is funding this stuff. They're just enjoying the fact that they're getting freebies from the government uh, in the process of getting non-dilutive capital into their company by betting a million bucks for some of the preliminary data that goes into the filing. So that you better believe the private sector does have an interest in these things, and this concept of market failure is a complete fraud. All right. This is just a way for people who know how to grease the system to basically write grants to get money into their private company that's non-dilutive. Uh, but the private sector is there, and they're the ones who actually put the first money up because they did the preliminary experiments. So the people that are in that system, they're always getting government paychecks, and there is no cost to them for – they don't have a competitor that necessarily, is necessarily competing with them per se for that money. They don't have a market review. You, you might get 12, 6 to 12 people in your study section. And almost all of those people in your study section for a grant are on the boards of various private companies throughout the biotech industry. But when you're in the marketplace, you don't have six people bottleneck and make a decision on whether the research should be done. You have the entire marketplace telling you you're wrong or you're right. right? So trying to get something done in the free market, you actually have more scrutiny in the free market than you will get from the peer review at the study section. And the people in the study section, the same damn people that are on the boards of these other of the other companies. So they're just a subselection of the marketplace. You're basically taking a statistical subsampling of brains, applying it to the review process, uh, and then handing out to government money. In the free market, you have all of them critiquing your work. So there isn't really this, this perceived notion that the market's not going to do this. We need to have the government do it instead. That's all a fantasy. Uh, that's not that's not really how things work in, in the biotech space. So um, I think you'll find with a lot of the folks that have academic funding, they believe the government needs to be in charge in cases like this. They don't see that the free market actually delivers results a lot faster. And they're very they tend to have a oh, they're greed based and we're public servant based, except for the public servant side of it takes their money through taxation, which no one can actually refute. <laughs> right. The greed's really coming from the government side. Uh, you can't – if you don't like stem cell research for ethical reasons, doesn't matter. We're taking your money anyway, anyway and doing it. Same thing's true with gain-of-function mutations on viruses. They were funding that for a while with our tax dollars, which who knows? Maybe it played a role in one of these viruses emerging. Right? It's very dangerous research, but you can't vote or opt out of it. In the private sector, you can. You can say, I'm not funding that because I, I, I think that's just shady stuff. Uh, I'm going to put my money in a startup somewhere else. All right. So there aren't the same economic incentives – on government funded research. There aren't those, those, those review mechanisms and there aren't those market forces that help balance it. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised you ran into people throwing stones at you if you critique the who, because the who is just another one of these hierarchical systems that's trying to tell the rest of the world what to do. How have your academic friends embraced you since you've taken this position? Uh, they tend to point to the weed stuff I'm doing to discredit me. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, yeah, it's not popular. I, it's not a popular opinion. But, you know, it's just been informed through experience. I've been on the government side of things and then I've gone into the entrepreneur side of things. And you get you get a very wholesome picture that way. You you see how things operate on one side of the fence and then you see how they, they operate in the free market side of things. And we by no means have a perfectly free market. You know, it's regulated to hell. But uh, it's it's certainly – I believe it is what's responsible for maybe some of the numbers you've seen at the World Bank. When you look at the World Bank, they've done a good job measuring how many people are coming out of poverty, right? There's been more people coming out of poverty like in the last 50 years than all of human existence. That doesn't happen with, with Orange Man in charge. That happens because the economy is growing. There's more um, interactions between people because we're more connected. So there's more win-win relationships that are being discovered throughout the world being hyper-networked. As a result, we have GDP that's growing, even though population's growing. That 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 can't happen in their model of it being a fixed pie, right? Like I'm rich, my my, my wealth came at the cost of someone being poor. That can't be true if more people are coming out of poverty than ever before, concurrent with population growth. That means the pie is getting bigger. Why is the pie getting bigger? It's getting bigger because we're more networked and we're finding more win-win relationships by being more networked. All right, it's 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 free market economics that are driving this, not structured hierarchical economics.